Oh, yeah, that's a bad joke. We'll let people start to get on. So hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to this program on um, extreme flooding and a Vermont library response. It's just a little bit before seven right now, so we will give people some time to, to come on and I'll get some odds and ends out of the way. My name is Maddie Wilworth, and I am the Adult and Reference Services Librarian at the Manchester by the Sea Public Library. Um, this program is a part of Crew Week. CREW stands for Communities Responding to Extreme Weather. Uh, I don't know about you, but I feel like we've seen a lot of that this summer and this fall. Um, I would say just in New England, but it's really all over the country. Um, I will add a link in the chat uh, where you can find more info and events for CREW Week. Lots of libraries and community organizations come together to plan programming on the topic of extreme weather and its effects. Um, so there's lots of stuff you can do if you're interested. A lot of it is virtual, so you can do it from anywhere. If um, So that link will be there um, after I do my little intro. Thank you so much to Dan Groberg and Carolyn Picasio. Um, Dan is the executive director and uh, Carolyn is the library director at the Kellogg Hubbard Library in Montpelier, Vermont. Um, thank you, both of you, for being here tonight. I know that we've already said this, but I know that you have a lot of work to do. So thank you so much for taking time to share your story with us. Um, this program is gonna be recorded. Um, so if you have to jump off, you'll be sent a link afterwards, um, just so everybody knows. Um, if you'd like to find out more info about the Kellogg Hubbard, um, and also if you wanna donate to their recovery efforts, I'm also gonna put a link in the chat to their website so you can go there as well. Um, Thank you finally to our partnering libraries, Gleason Public Library, Tewksbury Public Library, Topsfield Town Library, Amesbury Public Library, and especially to um, Chumsford Public Library, whose Zoom account and know-how is making this program possible. So thank you so much to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, so I'm gonna just uh, reiterate some of what I've already said for those who are just coming on now. Um, and then Dan and Carolyn are going to present for um, probably about 30 minutes or so. Uh, while that's happening, you're welcome to ask questions while that's going on. You can put them in the Q&A function right at the bottom of your screen, or you can put them in the chat, whatever works best for you. I'm going to sort of um, coordinate those questions and ask as many of them as I can once Dan and Carolyn are done with the presentation portion um, of the program. Uh, with that said, let me give us a little reiteration. So thank you again for coming. This program is Extreme Flooding and a Vermont Library's Response. On July 10th, 2023, Montpelier, Vermont, and many other cities and towns across the state were overwhelmed by a catastrophic rainstorm. The Kellogg Hubbard Library in the center of Montpelier was not spared, and in a statement released by the library, recovery will take months rather than weeks. Director Carolyn Picasio and Executive Director Dan Groberg are here to discuss the flooding that day, the challenges the library and community now face, how the library has remained flexible in offering services to its community, and what communities can do to stay resilient in the face of future storms. So with that, I will let Dan and Carolyn take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. So we've set this up as a Q&A with each other um, to talk about like what we what we are thinking about this event, what we were thinking at the time as it was unfolding. Um, and uh, yeah, so- We'll jump right, jump in. right in. Yeah. Um, so for people who are not familiar with Montpelier and, and the Cal Covert Library, can you tell us about the library in Montpelier. So Montpelier is the capital of Vermont. It's uh, home to about 8,000 people, give or take. Um, the Kellogg Hubbard Library is a nonprofit, uh, a nonprofit incorporated library. Uh, about a third of the libraries in Vermont are set up this way. So we're not municipal, which is going to be important in our story as we move along. 
Um, we've been a library continuously since 1895. The library building was, was built between 1894 and 1896. Um, and it's a wonderful downtown. I encourage everybody to come down and, and, and visit us. Don't just drive by on Route 2, like come into our, we have a beautiful historic downtown that, you know, is undergoing a little bit of rebuilding right now, but it's going to be really great again very soon. And what's the history of flooding with the library? Because this isn't the first time the library flooded. That is, that is very true. This is not the first time the library is flooded. So I want to show you guys just very briefly. This is our the front of our beautiful library. This was last summer and more in uh, in better times. Um, one of the things that I want to point out moving on to the like the talking about the history of flooding is that Montpelier is at the confluence of two rivers. So we have the north branch of the Winooski River, and then we have the main branch of the Winooski River, and they come together right at downtown. So this is also important in the in the flooding history of the library that they, we have water coming in uh, from two sources. And then here's our history of flooding. So um, the worst rain event in Vermont history was November 3rd to the 5th, 1927. Uh, and our library flooded to five and a half feet on the first floor. And uh, if you're looking, I've got a few little photos here of some of these prior flooding events. Uh, so the black and white photo is 1927. The photo in the middle is 1992. Uh, and then the one on the far right is a friend of the library who snapped a photo um, during the during the recent flooding event. And you can see that our first floor is actually raised up significantly from Uh, and then there was ice jam flooding in Montpelier and there was an ice jam in March uh, and the basement filled to the bottom of the window sashes. Uh, we had Hurricane Irene, which had flooding in different parts of the state, but didn't really affect the library. And then this this rain event um, was was worse than the 1992 flood. It was the worst since 1927. Uh, and we filled our entire basement with water. So take us back to July. Um... What was it like the day of the flood, the day before the flood? What did you know? Did you know how bad it was going to get? That's the interesting thing. So we're, we're one of many. So on Sunday, we see this is what we see. We see this. Um, uh, we see this forecast that's calling for inches of rain, widespread, heavy rainfall, locally high. But we see we see weather events with some frequency, and it was. It, it said numerous floods likely. We know that downtown Montpelier does sometimes flood, but it was really hard to say. We're getting numbers thrown at us, but we don't have a historical record in the library that says, okay, if the river crests to, it ended up cresting to like 21 feet, what that means for the basement of the library. So we're seeing this rolling in and saying, like, okay, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a weather event, but is is this an emergency? And so then on Monday, then we get to this, we get to these, these bright red, potentially life-threatening, significant rainfall. Uh, and then we're going, okay, this is a serious thing. We open the library as normal on Monday. We're watching these warnings roll in. We're seeing them come in on Facebook. Um, and we'll see some of those posts as we and, a, and our phones were, uh, we were getting alert messages we getting, that's right. uh, constantly throughout the morning. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, and they're, and getting like increasingly severe. And so uh, we opened the library for 10 AM and by noon, Dan and I are like, okay, maybe, maybe this, maybe we really actually need to close, but it hadn't even really started raining yet. So it was really, it was, it was a hard, a legitimately hard, fault to make to say this is going to be serious we for everybody's safety we need to send them home and we need to close the library so then we're looking at this is still on monday so this is i'm not going to read this whole press release but this is when we're starting to talk about this is when the city of montpelier is starting to say um Here's here here are the here are the river cresting levels so they're telling us that B bailey avenue bridge in montpelier high school that's on the other side side of town from the library and it lies lower. So we're saying, okay, that's going to flood, but is it going to get all the way back to the library? We are um, a block back from the North Branch and we are several blocks back from the main branch of the Winooski. So 
Uh, so it's still so that's but at this point we're saying yes this is a serious event and we need to close the library right. early and send everybody home but but again even here you know it says to expect flooding to be similar or worse to what we experienced in tropical storm irene again the library didn't flood at tropical storm right. irene um they said the river would crest at 19.8 feet it ended up uh cresting at 21.4 feet so even um with these warnings that were getting increasingly dire it ended up being much worse than they were expecting. It's true. Yeah. And so at two o'clock, um, we we implement our flood protocol. What are we getting at? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, we realize this is going to be serious. What did we do? Okay. So we have a flood procedure. And so we... And, and, and we implemented it. We're like, okay, we're reading, we're reading this as administrators having not experienced. Dan was two weeks in, week and a half in to his job at the library when this event occurred. Um, and I've been here for seven years, but have not experienced anything like this. And so this, um, and this flood procedure was written um, by a previous iteration of the administration that also had not lived through an actual flooding event. water in it that won't work like is this really the best scenario and we say well that's what the procedure says we need to follow our own procedure and so we we walked around and we flipped all the breakers off in the building and we felt legitimately silly doing it honestly like, it was it was really barely good. barely grizzling at yeah. the time if i recall um and it, yeah it, it didn't seem like anything we heard all these warnings but it didn't seem like anything serious was going to happen um you'll also see the saving materials in the library basement suggests moving books sale books <laughs> off the floor and onto tables um which we did which we, we did. did we moved one shelf of books up and you'll subsequently see how that was um woefully <laughs> inadequate <laughs> but we we followed the we followed the protocol um we we have since noted that we'll need to update the protocol and we'll talk about that a bit later, but we did um, proceed to, to follow these, these procedures. Yeah. All right. So now we're getting to, now we're getting to the day of the flood. This is, so it's, so we flooded, we started raining. It started raining overnight uh, and rained through the night. And um, so Dan, how did you monitor what was happening? And what were your thoughts during the flood? Well, I was at home Um with my two small children and basically we were trapped. So, I mean, Montpelier, basically they said, you can't get anywhere. The roads in and out of town were all closed. The highway was closed. Um, uh, we had been sent to pick up our kids early from school. We were sort of home with our kids. It finally started raining significantly in the, in the late afternoon and evening. Um, and I recall that, you know, in my yard that there was starting to be like a pond in the yard in a way that I haven't seen that before. That was unusual. Um, but there wasn't, I felt like there wasn't a lot that I can do. I, it was like a, definitely a feeling of helplessness. Um, I'm in a, a group of uh, business and organ business owners and organizations based downtown that has a Facebook chat group and um, people were sending messages and there were actually some businesses that had security cameras that were still um, oh, still okay. going and they were watching and sending screenshots from their security camera footage um, and you could see it getting increasingly worse. Um, you know, you see on the slide here, the police department posted uh, that's Main Street in Montpelier at 7.35 p.m. Um, but even, you know, even then, again, they were projecting, you know, the, the river was at 19.8 feet. It was still to rise um, beyond that. Um, I saw on, you know, social media, some people posting videos and photos from downtown. And you, um, my, my recollection, the thing I remember most was the sound of the um, alarms going off. So, um, uh, whether it was due to power outages or uh, other things, a lot of fire alarms or, or building alarms were going off downtown. So you'd see these videos of the water sort of rising and the, hear the alarms and it was almost an apocalypse, you know, like apocalypse movie. Um, but the, we were just like at home <laughs> uh, with nothing to, you know, there was nothing we could do at that point. Um, 
I remember that from the next day when we finally, yeah. when we finally did make it downtown. And then for the next several days after just everyone's fire alarms were going off and it was, it was like, uh, I've never seen anything like it. it and, and that, that became like the soundtrack of our, of our first days. Yeah. So if we go on to Tuesday morning. Yeah. So, so what, so then day after the event. So, um, what was it like being in the middle of this weather emergency? Well, again, we were sort of, you know, they said downtown was closed. It's not safe to come downtown. The water was still, you know, high downtown. Um, and at one point, um, you know, early in that morning, they said that the reservoir, which is And so directly, not, you know, several miles downstream, but directly below that is the city of Montpelier. That's our, that's our downtown. And they were saying that it could get worse if the reservoir overflowed. Um, and so we weren't able to go downtown. Um, we were getting some photos from people who either live downtown or again, some security camera footage and, um, yeah, it was just a lot to a, a lot to see, and but we couldn't access the building. And we, by that point, had seen some photos that made us realize that it was probably just the base, just the basement, um, and not the main floor of the library. But um, we didn't really know. And they then pushed back when people were allowed to access downtown from noon to three p.m. Um, and the emergency services were relocated from downtown because the police station and the fire department both flooded and city hall flooded as well. Um, residents that were in the path, right in the path of the North Branch River were evacuated or told to get up to the second floor of their home in case the water overflowed. There were water rescue teams on site. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd say a combination of like helplessness and um, definitely got nervous. I mean, my house is, is definitely up from downtown, but certainly nervous with my two kids and monitoring, you know, our own house and our basement and um, the that threat of the dam overflowing was certainly scary. For me, it was the not being able to get anywhere. Yeah. The As the roads, as we kept getting these weather alerts that the roads had closed, the roads had failed and washed out. It, it was like, well, the, like the interstate, we can always get out on the interstate and then the interstate closed. And so there are several ways out of Montpelier, but we got to a point where like you couldn't get to the hospital, you couldn't get to a grocery store, like emergency services were, were not able to access downtown, like everything everything closed everything was shut down and you really truly could not get out and get anywhere if you had to so finally by around 1 30 p.m the water started to recede um and here well if you want yeah. to go to the next slide um this is sort yeah. of what we were referencing with the emergency operations um being relocated with um waters continuing to rise um Again, you know, roads being closed and cut off. Uh, and they basically said, like, if you're not at a shelter now, there's stay nowhere home. to go. Like, yeah. you're get to your second floor, stay home. There's, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just grateful that my house wasn't also in the, in the path. Yeah. Um, you know, again, so this is uh, four o'clock. Finally, they, uh, realized that the, um, the the dam was holding at its max capacity and not likely to overflow the water had started to recede and they basically said if you have business being downtown you can come downtown and check um otherwise stay away yeah. this video works yeah oh so this is um some drone footage from vt digger a nonprofit online news um that just shows an overview of the flooding downtown. Let's see if this. It's checking. It's going. So I don't know how smoothly this video is playing, but you can see basically the 
what's in the center of your screen is State Street, one of the two main roads in town, and there's a cross street, Main Street. That's basically the core of our downtown. And you can, can't can distinguish between river and right. road anymore. Um, Let's see if we can go on to our next slide. Nope. So needs to... <laughs> <laughs> <What's> Oh that? no. <laughs> Perfect. Nope. So is that oh, is then. that gold dome the the yes, the gold dome is the state house. It is, yeah. yeah. One second while I advance this. There we go. Oh. There's our there's our there's our street. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so so this is the front lawn of the library. Um so tell us about tell us about finally being able to get to the library and being able to access it. Yeah, so we we kept hearing that the downtown was closed and they were pushing the downtown closure later and later and finally they said okay, we're going to open it at 3. And I'm on the other side of the river from the library. I'm not I'm not near downtown in the same way that Dan is. And so I'm looking at my the bridge that I have to cross with the water at the level of the bridge that's normally far below it and going, okay, I can get across there, but can I get, like, I don't even know if I can get to the library um, a mile away. And um, so I had to come in kind of the back way and take like this kind of higher ground route. And then I could get about a block away from the library. And then I had to walk the rest of the way. And I had to like skirt around and through backyards and just, just, to get to the door and and like I was puddle jumping um, and it was because the front of the library look, looked like this. And this is after the water had begun to recede already. Um, so I'm gonna load this video. I'm gonna try to play this video. So this is our first access of the library. This is around 3 p.m. On, on Tuesday, on the day after the flooding, the water had crested about 2 a.m. that morning. And so Jason, who is our, um, our building manager, he opens up the door and we've got him, hopefully we can do this, opening the door for the first time. Having both of our laptops going at once is not the kindest thing to do to our internet connection. <laughs> but, but hopefully you're able to see as he opens that door. <laughs> and, and out comes the river. <laughs> so he's heading into the library right now. He's heading yes. into the side entrance of the library right now. That's exactly what that is. And and the water just spilling out. Oh, it's trying to but, do that again. Yeah, I know. It doesn't like it when I do this. Let me me advance this way. There we go. And so this is the other view of that door. So this is this is now we're looking at the we're looking at that door from the other side from the first floor of the library. So like I said, we have an elevated first floor. So um, this is the this is ground level and this is how far the water came into our building. And so it's at this level at this point uh, throughout the basement. So it got to the point where it was about a foot or less from our basement ceiling. So it, it filled the entirety of the library basement. Um, all right. And then, so we've got a basement full of water. We've got some photos of, of that damage. Dan, like, how did we get the water out of the basement and clean up that huge mess? Yeah, if you wanna keep proceeding, you'll show here. Um, so this is the front stairs, again, um, looking down. Um, so you can see that, the, that's the stairs down into the basement. The water is there just beyond that step there. So that's a um, landing. A landing. Uh, yes, a landing about uh, eight steps up from the basement. And we were trying to just sort of see what we could see peeking around the corner. Um, and this is that shot that I was uh, peeking around the corner to get, which is, um, and this is, the day after that. So this is right. So this is this already is after, it's af after it's receded. Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, we we called some. Um, oh, my, my internet's unstable again. Uh, we called some companies um, that do sort of water damage mitigation. Um, we tried some local ones first, but we couldn't get a hold of anyone. And we called um, ServePro, which is like a national franchise. Some of you may be familiar with them. Um, and on uh, Wednesday, they uh, finally came to the library um, and started pumping out the building. We had some um, fits and starts, I'll describe it as, um, because we had um, two oil tanks in the basement that floated up in their containment area and spilled. Um, so this was not only water, sewage, you know, flood water, um, but also oil in the basement. Um, so we kept getting sort of updated information um, and we had ServePro all hooked up and ready to start pumping when we were told by the state Department of Environmental Conservation that we couldn't pump because there was oil and that we needed to call in a specialized oil remediation company. Um, and they said, basically, there's two companies in the state and and they're both books. And they're both books. And maybe they can come in a week. That's what we were told. Maybe they can come in a week. We, Carolyn called one of them and they they said, we can come. Probably next week. Probably next week. Yeah. And you have to put $5,000 down on yeah. a credit card right now, yeah. which we don't even have a credit. You know, we don't have a card with a limit high enough to do it. Um, and so. um it's hot. It's July, and our basement is full of thousands. How many? I don't remember, even eighty thousand gallons. Was that what we said or something? So it was at thousands of gallons of water. And like, do you know what that's going to do to our building and to our collection upstairs? And like, leaving water in this basement is not a choice. That is not an option. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, one advantage of Vermont being a small state is that our government is very accessible. So we were able to make some calls to some friends of some friends um, and get the Secretary of Environmental Conservation on the phone who basically overruled uh, the initial uh, decision and said, you need to do what you need to do to save your building and um, and we'll get back to you about the the oil part, but you need, you know, go ahead and start pumping. So finally, Wednesday at around 6 p.m., Servpro finally started pumping out the building. Um, and it did go fairly quickly at that point. They had three or four pumps going yeah. um, from different parts of the building. Um, but it was a very touch and go and nerve wracking a couple of hours, I would say. Do you remember the city turning off the water because we had water pouring in yes. a busted pipe? Yes, so there was a also so funny also a busted sprinkler pipe on top of this um and so more water was coming in and <laughs> this is one of our public works employees for the city um that's the uh what are we that's the street between yeah, yeah that's, that's a street. street that's in the middle of a street, in the street. Yeah. um <laughs> shutting off the water to our building so that the it didn't continue to get worse it didn't continue to fill up as we were trying to empty it out <laughs> Um, this was the photo again on Wednesday morning. Um, and this is a video of, um, we'll see if it plays, walking through the basement. Um, so you'll see, uh, you can see the books on the floor covered in water, shelving that had overturned. And there's... Um, some of the framing around the doors has um, has fallen apart and there's just piles of books soaked in water and oil on the floor yeah, and it stinks it smells it smells like it smells like oil it smells like like gasoline and when you went outside the building it smelled like natural gas do you remember that too the whole town smelled oh, for it weeks it was awful okay. yeah
So what was the damage like? Yeah. So uh, this is a photo. This is a photo that I took down in the basement. Um, as I'm trying to get, we had to like move these sodden books out of the way to try to wedge the doors open and get some natural light in there so that we could even begin to assess the damage. And I have another video that I didn't include in here walking through and I can hear myself narrating like, oh, I have to take all of this for insurance purposes. And because at that point I wasn't even thinking about anything going beyond having, I was like, we have flood insurance. We're fine. <laughs> turned out to be a very silly notion. But so we lost, our book sale was in our basement. We lost the entirety of the book sale inventory and all of the shelving. Um, we lost, and that was like, that was like a, the lower ticket item because what we lost, we had systems damage and systems are the most expensive thing in, in this building, really, um, outside of the historical structure. Uh, so we lost our elevator, which we had replaced three years before. We had done a four-year capital campaign to replace our elevator and then it got decimated three years later. Um, we lost our the electrical feed coming into the library and three out of our four breaker boxes, our security system, our fire system, our hot water heater, our heating system, mostly all of the circulating pumps and whatnot. Um, our oil tanks were ruined. Um, the silver lining for that is that we're moving away from using oil at all in the building. So that's a that's a that's great, but it's very unfortunate that that came out of this. Um, we lost one of our, we have, re our meeting rooms are really popular and we lost one of our meeting rooms and we lost our, our internet network. And, you know, as I, I know, you know, Maddie, and I'm sure that, that the viewers know, Rich Simmons know, um, being able to, particularly in a disaster, like we have so many people that come in and use our public computers, we're at access the print shop got destroyed. So like public printing and uh, particularly if you're trying to uh, file insurance claims and get a hold of FEMA and try to like recover from this disaster, you need internet infrastructure and you need printing. And so uh, happily we were able to get those going again really quickly. But the other thing that's not on here is our um, HVAC system. So we had two, right. two air handler units and our building control system, which manages the flow of air through the building and the outside air exchange, uh, a building wide humidifier system. Yeah. Um, the so control, all of the control panels for the whole heating system and the whole building and like all of that is the the only system that we did not lose was one uh, network yes switch switch yeah. and our server yeah. basically <laughs> yeah like all of it it was just gone we had it we had a we our collection was it was fine we didn't lose any of our collection but then this is uh, these photos are are more of the damage in the book sale. And this is once we got temporary lighting set up. Um, so this is this is early in the morning on Saturday when, is when these photos were taken. And the other way that we cleaned out the yeah. basement is that on, um, it's pretty remarkable actually, on Friday at about noon was when we finally felt like we could have people in the um some of the state inspectors had come to the building and and declared that it was safe for structurally sound. structurally sound um we finally felt like we could have volunteers and so friday at noon we put out the call for volunteers and saturday at 9 a.m we had a hundred and one volunteers come and our whole staff is meant um can that we could find in the building anything anybody could get their hands on and we and and we had these hundreds of volunteers and they just hauled everything out and and then once everything was out of the basement they started demoing the wet sheetrock and it was crazy it was a uh, it was quite a day so you can see the piles of debris and all through town there were piles like eight feet like yes. above your head piles of debris yes. uh, lining the sidewalks you would like navigate through little um alleyways through the debris never seen such yeah so what was how was the library able to operate given all of this yeah um so uh, i hate using the term silver linings from the pandemic i really really don't like saying that but it's it's the truth here 
So we moved to curbside pickup, which is what we had done during the pandemic. We had contactless pickup and we said, okay, we got our phones restored really quickly. Our phone company, um, technology company that we work with came in and set up a VoIP system. Uh, and so we got phone service back. We quickly re were able to reroute most of our network and get most of our network back online. And then we operated curbside pickup and digital services. And we moved our, our children's programs. We do mostly outdoors in the summer anyway. We moved those to higher ground. We were able to work with the Vermont um, uh, College of Fine Arts and use part of their campus to hold our programs. Uh, we kept outreach and home delivery going. We got a public computer hooked up with an extension cord on our front steps. Uh, and even though we were not technically maybe supposed to, one of the virtues of being a nonprofit, Dan and I have uh, a lot of control over our building because it's essentially like private property owned by the nonprofit. So uh, so we were told that you could let, we could let authorized people into the library and we chose to authorize anybody that really needed to use the bathroom because we still had cold running water and a bathroom on the first floor with a toilet that could flush. Um, the uh, worth noting here is that we were doing this all with a very provisional electrical setup. So we had an electrician come and he was able to set up a temporary skid yeah. outside on the lawn um that had basically eight extension eight, cords. eight power outlets <laughs> and we could run extension cords and the only power we had in the building was what was running running to extension cords and we existed like that until september 11th so we we're just talking about like, just two weeks ago um we got full power restored <laughs> to the building um and and maddie when we were talking before the presentation was referencing i'm sorry we didn't put this picture in here yeah. but our librarians, we bought them all headlamps um, because there's no there was no overhead lighting in the building for this two months, um, and the stacks were dark, um, and so we needed headlamps to be able to see the books to pull for the curbside delivery. Um, yeah, and the computer running that we could that we could do check ins and check outs on, and we got the public printer on an extension cord, and we just we just kept going. And pretty, pretty remarkably, we were able to do about two thirds of our normal circulation we, via curbside. In August, we circulated 20,000 books this method on this, on this, under this tent on these tables. And in a typical month, we would do about 30,000. Yeah. Um, I think we'll skip this video in the interest of time. But the next question is, how are we going to pay for all this? And this video, um, which is you can find on our website, um, we got uh, Alison Bechdel, who's you probably all know, is a um, incredibly talented um, illustrator and author, uh, cartoonist and author, um, is a friend of the library, and a, she. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. Can you see us and hear us again? Great. Um, so we've done about $330,000 in private fundraising from individuals and foundations, a little bit from the state as well. Um, and then... <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about getting federal help. What was the federal uh, requesting assistance like? Well, so we were invited to this um, meeting where they showed this lovely flow chart. Um, which was the the process of what federal funding looks like. I, I don't know that I've ever seen, I don't know if you could call this a flow chart really, but um, <laughs> incredibly complicated process. But essentially first you needed to apply for a small business administration loan um, and only FEMA would only cover anything above and beyond this small business administration loan. So we thought from the beginning, 
we're going to get this loan from the Small Business Administration. Um, I'm sure they'll cover whatever we need because the maximum was $2 million. Um, and we'll be we'll get this loan and we're not going to end up dealing with FEMA. Instead, we're going to have $50,000 in debt to pay off every year for the rest of for 30 years, <laughs> um, which was not an exciting prospect, but we thought we'd be done with it. Um, and then we experienced some whiplash, I would say, because in fact, our small business administration loan application was denied, um, which ultimately ends up being a good thing because it Hopefully. makes us, yeah, <laughs> remains to be seen, makes us eligible for FEMA um, assistance, which is a grant and not a loan, um, but not what we were expecting at all. Um, and <laughs> Working with FEMA has already proven to be quite an interesting process. We spent about eight hours with them uh, last week in person, uh, where they spent several hours just like going through it, literally inch by inch the basement. Um, and then this is another uh, slide they showed at this um, meeting we were invited to. This is the 10 procurement mistakes to avoid. Uh, so this whole time we're like worried about saying something wrong or we're just trying to get the building up and running and meanwhile it's like if you if you do this process exactly right you will get denied and now we don't have sba well technically we could go back and appeal the small business administration decision if we had to but now we've got this this grant that we're pursuing but it's very very complex and very, very detailed to try to get them all. Of, and I'm thinking like, again, like, you know, we're librarians, we're good at this. Like we keep good records and we can get that. We're wonderful at finding information. And it's, this is, this is hard. Yes. We, we have to basically inventory our damage to the, every, to every component. Like we had to count yeah. how many Lips today counting power outlets today that were damaged for a damage inventory. But, and that's, the, this damage inventory is completely distinct from this other FEMA division's damage inventory that we also have to do that's categorized a different way. Yeah. So um, we're expecting it to be many, many months. Um, FEMA will cover 75% of what they deem to be eligible. Um, and then we're responsible for the other 25%. Um, but right now we're thinking it's going to be around one and a half million dollars. Um, to get back up and running. Um, we did, as Carolyn mentioned, have Can you hear us? Oh, can you hear us? Okay, great. Um, so it's gonna be a long, challenging process. Yeah. Um, and a lot of money and yes. So tell us about the library today. Yeah. So uh, we went from having that very, very provisional skid of uh, power that was like homeowner power. Now we have our full 600 amp three phase power working, but it's in this information shed you see in the, in the upper corner. And that was a gift from kind of the city, but the ownership over this was kind of unclear. It had been built by volunteers and uh, it had flooded, but we can use it to put our power, to lock our power away so that it's safe and we can have full power restored. We've rerouted our network. We've replaced our phones. We've demolished the basement down to the exposed brick. And so the photos that you're seeing on the bottom um, on on my left, you can see the what the book sale looked like. This is from December of 2022. So that was the book sale seven months prior to the flood. And that's what it looked like the entirety of the time I've been working at the library. And then the middle photo is uh, our colleague George standing in that same room after it's been demoed. Um, and then to the right, that's just another area of our basement. And no, and and another thing, we're looking at this exposed brick and going, we should leave that. That's really pretty. <laughs> so, you know, we're trying to keep uh, positive through all of this. Um, but we're, so we're navigating FEMA and we're navigating fundraising. We are trying to coordinate this massive rebuild. Um, and one of the, uh, one of the, I was talking about the benefits of being a nonprofit. I mean, we've had to do this on our own. Everything that we do in the library, we do ourselves and we manage ourselves because there's not a municipality that that takes some of that over for us. 
Uh, so what's next? And the next steps. Yeah, we are. Well, so Dan has been completely on board with the idea of moving all of these essential systems up above the flood line. So, um, and so we're navigating that with FEMA as well, because FEMA pays to replace things, but then there's a separate hazard mitigation project that you can pursue to, um, to uh, future proof your building, which is what we're trying to do. They will cover if you if you have to move systems because of code changes. So we're you know we're we're figuring all of that out. This is a whole new learning curve, a whole new set of skills that we didn't think we were going to have to have. Um, and we want to have like movable stacks in our basement. We're hopeful that some of our we had a couple of smaller spaces that we would love that were closets that we would actually like to change into smaller format meeting rooms because we have a need of that. We had a need of that before this event. Um, and we're updating those flood procedures with some better, more specific data of like it, like if if you're going to crest over 17 and a half feet, yes, you really have to get everything out of the basement. And for the love of God, call the elevator cab to the second floor before you shut the power off. <laughs> so, and then and then speaking about resiliency in downtown Montpelier, there's conversations going on. Um, uh, like yeah, I, I'd say what's challenging is both this urgent need for everyone to move forward and for businesses that have been flooded to reopen. I mean, for their sustainability, they're losing revenue, you know, every day that they're not open. Um, balancing that with, um, you know, future proofing and even some more grandiose ideas, you know, it's been floated like, what if you move, move downtown uphill, um, you know, that kind of conversation. So um, I'd say it's a challenging um, conversation and, and balancing act. There's been a series of forums that were convened and now there's a commission on uh, flood recovery. Um, but I think really it's going to be like longer term conversations about what can the Army Corps of Engineers do upstream. Um, areas, things like that. So we've started to reopen downtown, I'd say maybe um, a dozen businesses have reopened at this point. Do you think they're half? Do you think businesses are better or open? No. No. No, not half. No. no. no like, less. <laughs> less than a quarter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's it's going to be a it's going to be a process. Um, and I think everyone, the main thing people have been focusing on is moving those systems up, which is in part um, the city is really um, pressuring people to do that, yeah. um, which is ultimately good. But um, I know difficult and expensive for some people. So yeah. we'll stop there. Um, yeah. We'll put up our, our website uh, on the next slide. Yeah. And then uh, we're happy to answer if anybody has any questions, Maddie. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. We did, um, we lost you a little bit when you were talking about um, what the stuff you were doing with Allison and other things like that. Could you um, reiterate that again? Yeah, of course. It wasn't so, FEMA related, but other ways that you were. Um, yeah. So we created a fundraising video um, that featured Allison Bechdel and uh, Senator Patrick Leahy, um, who's a, uh, was the longest serving senator in U.S. history. And this is and this is his home library, um, and he tells a great story. He will talk your ear off about coming here as a as a child and going to the children's library in the basement at the time, um, and having his first library card here, and and one of the librarians giving him the love of of reading and learning. And he's actually um, been very generous throughout his life, including um, he's a, a big Batman nerd yeah um and he's uh had small cameo appearances in several batman movies and donated all of the royalties so they once a quarter us. we get the royalty checks from yeah. uh, <laughs> you know warner brothers um that he donates to the library so the um allison Bechtel and senator Leahy appeared in this fundraising video that we used and um we've raised about 330 dollars um through private fundraising um and you know coming in still uh we have a fundraising auction going on right now actually with some great items if anyone wants awesome. to go on our website and check that out awesome uh, we did have a question about do you guys know not just for you but for everyone who was sort of pumping out their basements 
was the water just going back into the street and then heading back into storm drains pretty much? Or was there, what was the, what was that like? What was going, what was Well, one through? thing we didn't mention. So yes, is the answer to that question. That it was, was um, and I'm sure the rivers were incredibly contaminated downstream oh, sure. of here. Oh, the stuff that you saw floating down the river, it was, there was so yeah. much, so much debris. Um, but what, but we pumped onto our lawn because that was the advice that we were given because it would at least filter through the soil. And then we subsequently did soil remediation working with the EPA. Yeah, the EPA exactly. showed up. Another thing you don't expect to do as a librarian um, or library director is to have the EPA show up at your door and say- The giant dirt- <laughs> Cute. with a giant dirt <laughs> vacuum and say we need to suck up your lawn because it's contaminated with oil uh, contamination so someone mentioned in the chat that they saw the picture of the tent looked fine and that's because that was one of the areas that did not have either the debris or the um the oil oily water um mm -hmm. but it the EPA actually yeah. <laughs> the plants look so gorgeous I know, we yeah. do have gorgeous plants so yes <laughs> Here that maintains them she was there right away <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, it was great. um but they ended up digging volunteers. A, a foot down they did yes yeah. so the epa down. dug up not the entirety of our lawn but but large chunks of it where we had been draining out this water um mm -hmm. and they dug a foot down and they said oh we we don't charge you to do the soil testing and to take the dirt away which was great i'm not complaining about that but they don't replace anything yeah. <laughs> So they left us with a dug up lawn. Yeah. And thankfully, um, we called on a very generous corporate um donor in doing this again perfect um someone else was asking do you guys know uh, sort of the FEMA process is obviously very complicated difficult for you guys but also you've got all these homeowners who are also trying to do the same thing at the same time and and, and don't have the kind of research acumen that most librarians have to to have to do the job are they also having the same sort of sort of, sort of issues so my understanding, so we're dealing with one specific part of FEMA called FEMA Public Assistance mm -hmm. um, that municipalities and certain nonprofits can qualify for, mm -hmm. libraries among them. Uh, it's a separate pot from the homeowner pot. Right. But mm -hmm. I know that homeowners were also asked to apply for um, loans first in a lot of cases. And um, I've, I've heard that it's yeah again it's complicated it's slow moving um you often have to appeal things they yeah it's it's not what anyone needs to deal with when they're in the yeah. when they're just trying to figure out how to physically dig out yeah. um, when many people are still dealing with the issue of not having internet and not being able to print stuff and then exactly. they yeah, have absolutely. to do all this stuff Online. And there were, you know, the, in Montpelier, so there was flooding in, in different parts, catastrophic flooding in different parts of the state with this event. And so uh, our kind of sister community, our, our nearest community is Barrie. And so one of the juxtapositions between Barrie and Montpelier, in Montpelier, most of what flooded in the downtown was businesses. That is not to say that there were not homes and homeowners that were affected. If you go on realtor.com, for example, and, and look at Montpelier, Vermont, you're going to see homes that are now on the market because the owners can't deal with the recovery. They can't, like, it's... Um, yeah. and for you know for a variety of very very good reasons and so there are these gutted homes for sale right now um but in barry what was so their downtown was was affected also but they lost housing stock housing inventory and they lost um particularly lower income and subsidized housing and so the difference the difference between in the way that recovery happens in a community based on the type of loss has also been you know, interesting, but but horrifying and, and, and very difficult to watch. Yeah. And, and one thing, you know, that I'm very conscious of is that like Montpelier is generally considered to be a wealthier community than Barrie. Um, 
the are both towns created like private fundraising funds um and the montpelier fund has raised just over two million dollars and i think the berry fund has only raised like two hundred thousand dollars um so it's pretty striking um especially when it was the low income homeowners in Barrie that were most hard to yeah, hit. Yeah, the people that got affected the most were the ones that that really could could not have couldn't absorb it but there are houses there are houses in um uh there's there are houses in down state street particularly we have some really low-lying areas and those homeowners are being told um, that they have to actually raise their houses up seven or eight feet. They have to raise their whole house up over the above the flood line. And so figuring out where the money is going to come from for that, yeah. um, who exactly is requiring it? Is it a code requirement now from the city? Um, and then figuring out how to navigate that process is also it's just it, it the whole thing is just complex and there's there's layers and layers and layers of complexity depending on your individual situation. Yeah. So you said that the so the children's room used to be in the basement and yep. the now the first floor is sort of was it always like that or was the library at some point raised because of these flooding things? No, um, none of the nothing had really changed since the previous flood. Um, yeah. They left all the systems in the basement for us to deal with. <laughs> but what the it's so, so what daunting, the yeah. So. <laughs> In yeah. our experience, they're not hundred year. We're not looking at hundred year flooding events, and we're trying to figure out well, what is the frequency, and then how. Um, but these these discussions about climate change and resiliency, I, I think, in previous flooding events, just didn't happen in the same way. It was considered really like a freak event that would not be repeated, you know, for the amount of time you owned your business or the for your lifetime. Yeah, and that's just not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, we did have someone ask how many people work at the library and how and what was what was this like for for a lot of them who were either commuting or communicating with you and not really knowing what was going on while well, you weren't really knowing what was going on what was that like yeah we have 12 um sort of normal staff and then another about dozen subs and pages um and thankfully none of their homes were affected um, but definitely communication was, um, yeah, just something like we were, I was, we were trying to be, make sure to communicate as much as we could. Um, but there was so much going on, um, you know, communicating with our board and with our staff and with the public and, and figuring out what we were doing all at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, none of our, none of our staff were personally were personally affected like their homes were not destroyed but we had a lot of road washouts and, and a lot of people that couldn't get to the library even if they wanted to and so yeah. there was but but we were able to say well well we didn't have to furlough or lay anyone off everybody was paid through throughout the entirety dan immediately went to the board and 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 you know said we need to pay everyone throughout this while we recover even if the building is closed and got yeah. that that approval and um yeah. So it was, it's been, you know, it's been a lot on the heels of the pandemic, particularly and having interrupted and changed services. And then we, we kind of achieved normal for, uh, you know, normal, we kind of achieved normal for a little while. And now we're like right back in it. And uh, Karen, I mentioned this was my 13th day on the job. Um, I, I, I keep on forgetting and then remembering it again. Brand new. I was brand new. I, you know, my background's in nonprofit management. So certainly I'm not new to nonprofit administration, but I had barely learned the the basics of this new job when this happened so um i'm i'm incredibly grateful to carolyn and all the staff who knew what they were doing so that when i was suddenly thrust into this basically entire new job of managing this disaster um the library was able to keep running you knew where to find the procedure document Right. <laughs> that's always the thing is like well, we have one but does anybody know where, where it lives on your server is it current yeah. yeah that's awesome um we did have someone ask is there um 
a way that the, the the presentation slides could be shared or perhaps just the videos could be shared. People really enjoyed yeah. them, but it was hard to to watch them Absolutely. a little bit. And so they We're definitely want to see I'm them again. Sorry about our, our internet. Okay. We're happy to it's so strange. You had a horrible thing happen at your library. Now your internet's not perfect. And, and not all of our network extenders are working yet. And I just realized like in the room we're sitting in, we just, we chose this room with this beautiful background and we're a little bit uh, too far from the nearest network extender. So I think mm -hmm. that was part of our, our network issue, but yes, with a short, yes, we can. Uh, absolutely. Awesome. We'll send all them right. to you. Thank you both so much for doing this tonight. This was so fabulous and wonderful. And um, I think someone in the chat, I think definitely said it. They said, this has been a very enlightening, the sad presentation. Your positive attitudes are refreshing and reassuring given the obstacles that you are dealing with. Thank you. So I think that speaks for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you absolutely for having us. Have a nice night. You as well.